from the University of Kansas Health System. I am amazed. The team here is great. I came on a Tuesday and then by Saturday I had a heart in me. I have never seen a group of people work together so good as this team of heart specialists. I mean, it's just unreal. Stand by to set up show. And the Dolph C. Simons Jr. Family Broadcast Studio. Always makes you feel like you're the most important patient on the planet. I felt heard and that was really big. This is All Things Heart. Good morning, I'm Alexis Del Cid. Welcome back to All Things Heart. Here's what we're talking about today. And we have said this before, everything comes back to your heart. That includes your prostate. Learn how one man underwent a minimally invasive alternative to a very common problem. It promises faster recovery and fewer risks, and it had him back to action in no time. As always, we love your questions. We wanna answer every single one of them. So be sure to send them in to us on YouTube, Facebook, X, or to the All Things Heart email. You will see all those links right there on your screen. A retired physical therapist from Wichita, Kansas, knows firsthand that knowledge is power, especially when it comes to your health. Janine Kiesling shows us how Ken Welk overcame a common problem that many men suffer from using the power of a second opinion that he got right here at the University of Kansas Health System. Ken Welk has a chronic condition in common with 50% of men his age. The medical solutions to his problem seemed invasive. So Ken asked for another opinion at the University of Kansas Health System. Five years, that's how long Ken Welk researched treatments for benign prostatic hyperplasia, or BPH. He knew one day he'd need to do something. He didn't know he'd find the help he needed just three hours away, or how easy the treatment would be. And actually this happened to me when I was in Ireland and Scotland, and go play golf and then drive from the golf course back to the hotel. And I said to the driver, you gotta pull over or I'm gonna pee my pants. Ran into this Irish pub to the back and did my business, got in the, to the vehicle and drove back to the hotel where I peed again. That's the way Ken Welk has been living his life, worrying about when the next need to go would hit and how close he'd be to a bathroom. That produces anxiety for sure. Ken is not alone. Half the men his age suffer BPH, an enlarged prostate gland that can lead to pain and difficulty urinating. Ken's case grew so severe, he needed treatment. He searched the internet for answers. I studied all the different ones and saw how invasive a lot of them are, the other procedures, and so I stumbled across PAE, the prosthetic artery embolization. Prosthetic artery embolization is done by an interventional radiologist who uses imaging guidance to inject small particles into the prostate to reduce blood flow, which shrinks it. It's an outpatient procedure that doesn't require the patient to be under full anesthesia. The best part, within hours, urinating returns to normal. And I actually went and saw a urologist like three or four years ago and asked him about this procedure. And he said, I don't know, I don't know anything about it. Ken tried to find a doctor in California where he and his wife lived six months out of the year, but he didn't have any luck. Then his friend told him about the care he'd received at the University of Kansas Health System. I primarily went off his recommendation that his health care that he received there, he said it was top notch. Ken went back to researching and that led him to surgeon Dr. Adam Alley. I seemed to care about me as an individual not as a procedure. Ken says it's been smooth sailing since the procedure and he hopes others take pause and get a second opinion before agreeing to more painful, invasive options. Getting a second opinion by a different type of practitioner, i.e. an interventional radiologist who specializes in doing prostate artery embolization, that makes a lot of sense to me. We are so pleased to welcome Ken Welk to today's program, along with urologist Dr. Donald Neff and Dr. Adam Alley. Dr. Alley is a vascular interventional radiologist who performs the procedure to fix BPH. Thank you all for being here. We really appreciate your time. Ken, how long were you struggling with these symptoms? Gosh, easily 10 to 15 years. That's the worst. It's no way to live when a bathroom's the first thing you look for 
every time you're in any situation, which is basically what happened to you? And the second time and the third time, even more so than looking for a bathroom is having to strategize traveling from home to maybe someplace 20 to 30 minutes away and strategizing where can I go to the bathroom at a McDonald's or somewhere before I to, to get to my destination. It must be such a relief to not just have that lingering anxiety taking up space in your mind. It's, it's been life changing for me, for sure. Yeah, my anxiety level about that's gone down a lot. That is so good to hear. And Dr. Naff, you're nodding your head. I want to get to you as soon as possible because you have to leave quickly uh, a little bit before the, the episode is over to see your patients. So we want to be clear, you didn't treat Ken, but he did speak to other urologists who said they weren't aware of this procedure. How familiar are you with this treatment option? Well, from a technical standpoint, I would say not very because it's not a procedure I do. However, I was fortunate where I trained in Milwaukee, we had a very cutting edge interventional radiology department who was investigating this um, a little over 10 years ago. So I was more aware of it, certainly didn't participate in it. Um, it's, it's sort of entered the conversation with BPH treatment uh, over the years and actually 2023 was the first year it's now included in the AUA uh, treatment uh, algorithm for BPH management, along with a lot of other minimally invasive and quite frankly, invasive procedures for this uh, problem. And, and the reason we have you on our program, All Things Heart, is because there's always a heart connection. I wanna ask you, we've mentioned this option is minimally invasive. There are other ways to treat this, but those drugs can have risks to the heart. Yeah, I think we have. We sometimes lose sight of the fact that drugs, medications are an intervention, and any intervention we do, whether it's medical or surgical, is going to have potential side effects or adverse events. Um, some of the alpha blockers that we use for BPH um, can uh, potentially increase the risk of, of heart failure. Um, some of the older drugs are more common with that. The more modern selective ones are less common, but that's something we've known for about 20 years. So your biggest concern when you see a patient with benign prostatic hyperplasia is is what? Uh, well, first of all, kind of take it back to basics. You want to do sort of a full, you know, history and physical exam, make sure you're understanding the problem, screen for appropriate malignancies um, such as prostate cancer, um, and make sure you're understanding the patient's symptoms and most importantly, their goals. And I think we're uh, very fortunate here at the University of Kansas Health System uh, that there isn't a single prostate pr uh, treatment procedure we don't offer, whether it's prostate artery embolization, other minimally invasive treatment options to uh, major surgery. Um, so we want to assess both uh, the patient goals and symptoms and use a shared decision making to, to choose the right procedure for the right patient at the right time. The numbers are pretty remarkable. As Janine was sharing with us, 50% of men, 50% between the ages of 51 and 60 have BPH. And then that percentage seems to go up exponentially with age. Why is that so common? Well, we certainly have an aging population and, and people are, are living longer than they ever did uh, in the past. Um, it's, it, there's a genetic component to it that seems to run in families or, or certain ethnic groups, but um, it's also driven in, in some part by testosterone and other growth factors. The prostate is simply one of those organs that, that can grow with time and it, it is a part of and surrounds the urethra and as that grows, it blocks the urinary flow and, and causes the problems that uh, the people seek us out to treat. I want to bring Dr. Alley in now because Dr. Alley, Ken looked all over the country. He was looking all over California to find a doctor to perform this surgery. He winds up finding you. This is a guy in Wichita. He finds you just a couple of hours away. How is this procedure so rare? Why is it so rare? Uh, well, as with any other new developments in medicine, it just takes time for sort of the literature and for us to figure things out and to get it going. With this particular procedure for this indication, uh, it's really been over the last 10 to 15 years to just where it's really gotten some momentum behind it and some good literature behind it. And so it just takes time for these kinds of things to get out there. That's why we're always uh, very fortunate to be at the university at this health systems where mm -hmm. innovation and collaboration with the multidisciplinary approach, uh, people with these lower urinary tract systems, as Dr. Neff was pointing out, uh, need full urological evaluation to check for other conditions such as malignancy. And so it's really important to have all these people together to come up with the appropriate uh, treatment decision. And sometimes out in the community in some smaller places, you may not have all the specialties available, 
and all the options available for every patient. So it's, it's very fortunate to be at, at this institution. We have a, a great illustration that we want to share with you. It's actually a video, and Dr. Ali, you were talking us through this video we have. This is of uh, BPH and then the treatment. So what are we looking at with this video? Yeah, so this particular video, is, so this image right here, what they were first showing was how we gain access to the cardiovascular system and use it to direct a small tube into the very small blood vessels that are going to the prostate. And the goal is to get those small beads that go out into the very small vessel, blood vessels in the prostate. They get stuck in the blood vessels like rocks in a garden hose. Mm -hmm. They reduce the blood supply to the prostate and hopefully get it to shrink as you're seeing in that image there. Now okay. the reason that that's important is because the prostate surrounds the urethra or the tube that's going from the bladder for, uh, when you urinate and so it's like pinching the garden hose. So if you can reduce the size of the ball that's pinching the garden hose, hopefully you can relieve the symptoms. With so many men that have this problem, it seems like a design flaw that this has to be there and then these poor guys have to go to the bathroom all the time. Um, it's so remarkable that something like that works to give someone like Ken relief. You actually shared some medical imaging from Ken's case with us as well and we're gonna pull this up in the monitor yeah. behind us. What are we looking at here? So the first thing here is this is just uh, with every patient we you know see them in clinic, we'll obtain a CT scan or a, a CAT scan as a, it might be called. And what we're doing here is this is showing the prostate. So this is this particular image is um, like when the magician has their assistant and they cut them in half and mm -hmm. we're standing and looking up into the body. So where so, is, excuse my not knowing this, but where's oh, yeah, the prostate you, you here? Bet. So here it's, you want to uh, point with the pen? I got one right okay. here, yeah. So it's that thing there. Okay. In the and center. then we'll use it to make sure that there's good arterial pathways and the patients are a candidate for the procedure. Okay. The, the blood vessels can have blockages. These blood vessels are very, very small. So we always want to make sure that uh, they are a candidate before we operate on anyone. And so, so looking at this, you knew Ken was a candidate? Yeah. Okay, and then what's this we're looking so at? So then this is the actual procedure. So over here, you can see the tube going into the blood vessel. Uh -huh. The black stuff is the dye within the blood vessels that allows us to see it on the x-ray. And what we're doing is we're getting ready to plan and start to find the prostate artery so we can get that tube in there and deliver the beads. So Ken, when this when this image is taken, is Ken asleep? Uh, he is has he... something called moderate sedation usually, uh -huh. so it's kind of like twilight. So like when you have your wisdom teeth removed or something like that? Uh, I'm not sure exactly yeah. what kind of um, anesthetic they use for, for that. But, but that it, similar thing correct, where you're half. Yes, it's, okay. it's twilight. You, you uh -huh. don't have a tube down your throat usually. It's not full anesthesia, but it's just something to help you relax and keep you comfortable. Okay, okay. Yeah. So as we look at these images, these images, was everything going just as you expected with Ken? Yeah, so this is a great image. So this is, uh, there's a tube going into the left prostate artery. So there's one on the left and one on the right. And what this is showing is the blood vessels going to the prostate. Now, uh, this is a great example of the, one of the things that you have to consider when you're doing these is you don't want those beads going somewhere you don't want them to go. So on his left side, you can see some other blood vessels that are coming down that are not going to the prostate, which uh, I can see clearly, but, uh, but this allows us to see it. So we did not actually deliver the beads from the left to be safe. And so if we can go to the next image. Okay. So this here, you can, you can see now where it's going. So this would be the prostate. It's now going in a direction somewhere else, so we don't want to give the beads. And so we moved on to the right side. So these, this is his prostate. Right the, the, yeah, center. that is right okay. there. Yep. That's so, fascinating. yeah, that that's going uh, not into the prostate, and so we wouldn't want to give those beads there. I want to talk to you a bit more as we continue to look at these images about the heart connection, because you were saying that a good portion of men who have prostate problems also are at risk for heart problems. Well, so there's there's a higher prevalence of cardiovascular disease in patients with benign prostatic hyperplasia. We're not exactly sure why that is yet, where the medical community is working on it, but we do know that that's higher, there's a higher prevalence of it. So and as Dr. Neff was talking about earlier, the medications that can we can use to treat it um, can cause cardiovascular uh, issues, so you can get hypotension and things like that. They are usually very well tolerated, but it's very important to have it prescribed and managed by a, a healthcare provider, experienced so healthcare provider. This is an option, though, that avoids those medications that could put Ken at risk for 
heart problems. Correct. So uh, let's just back up for um, one minute. So when you start having these lower urinary tract symptoms, it's very important to get a full urologic evaluation. As we mentioned before, uh, prostate cancer is a real thing, and we want to make sure we evaluate for that before we proceed with, with treatment options for other stuff. Most of the time in this treatment algorithm, you'll start with medications, because if the medications um, can help you give you relief and they're working, uh, it makes sense to not take the risk versus benefit of not only this procedure, but any other procedure. Oh, so okay. if the medications don't work and you continue to have your problems, that's when we'll usually uh, move on to try to see which uh, option is best for you. Ken, did you have any heart-related issues or have you had any since? Uh, not that I know of. I will tell you, I tried all the different medicines before I had this procedure done and I just could not tolerate them. They, the side effects of a dry mouth and headache and blurred vision were just a problem for me. So I just, I couldn't tolerate the medicines. We have plenty of community questions coming in. I want to take a minute to thank Dr. Donald Neff, who joined us. He had to bug out early to see patients, which is always uh, always something that the doctors are doing. They're always juggling and gen donating their time to come help us educate our viewers on this topic. So let's get right to some questions from our community. We have a great question from Sam. Sam wants to know, if having an enlarged prostate is so common, is there anything we can do to prevent it? Oh, that's a great question. So unfortunately, uh, BPH it comes with age. Uh, what we do recommend is just as anything else, uh, health, uh, an active lifestyle, exercise, and a good diet are good for the prostate. And so just as a general health thing that we know so far, uh, that's what we recommend to try to prevent it that way, but it, it does come with age. So. so if you live long enough, you're going to have an enlarged prostate? Uh, is that you should be prepared yes. be prepared <laughs> yeah. brace yourself for that and healthy living can yes. minimize the, the damage there Marcy wants to know for Ken Ken were you in pain after the procedure what was the recovery like so the primary discomfort I had after the procedure was primarily from the catheter that was inserted uh, while I had the procedure which was in for about three and a half to four hours so I was just a little irritated with that so I had some discomfort with urination for the rest of the day and by the next day it was pretty much gone and then also I had just kind of a general ache in my prostate area through the end of the day but was gone the next day so very minimal discomfort. So Ken I have a question for you was there a moment after this procedure where you were somewhere out in public or in the car and you realized oh my gosh I haven't had to go to the bathroom this is incredible. Uh Actually the most surprising thing was that I, after having the catheter in and they took the catheter out and I was going to uh, to be dismissed. The nurse asked me if I needed to urinate. I said, well, I just had a catheter. And she goes, well, sometimes you do. And I said, yeah, I think I do. And and I did uh, urinate quite a bit then. And then it seemed to me uh, it didn't take as long, or it took longer for me to feel the need to urinate after that, so. Do you wish you had the procedure sooner? Uh, you know, I can, I'm kind of fatalistic about that. You know, everything comes with its own time. Um, I guess a short answer would be yes, because it, uh, I think I was ready to have this a couple of years before, but I just couldn't find the doctor that uh, I felt comfortable doing it uh, with. So, um, yeah, the answer is yes. That's the second time we've interviewed a patient of yours for on a completely different topic who said they, they couldn't find someone to help them anywhere in America, and then they find Dr. Alley. And you're able to do this life-changing procedure that's helping so many men. Um, James, it's a question for you, Dr. Alley. James wants to know, this could be nuanced, what's the difference between a cardiologist and an interventional radiologist? Uh, that's a good question. So a cardiologist is a medical, is a physician who specializes in the treatment of cardiovascular disease that sometimes involves the use of image-guided procedures like the one we've seen here today. A vascular interventional radiologist is a specialist in image-guided procedures to treat a wide variety of things that sometimes involves the cardiovascular system. Okay, and then Denise wants to know, if this has such a quick recovery, why isn't this performed more often? Uh, so it's like we stated earlier, uh, it is n newer to the medical field. It's uh, the first one for this indication uh, was about 2010. Uh, we have been doing prostate artery embolizations for years before that for bleeding. Mm -hmm. um, but for this development, for this particular indication, it just takes time 
uh, for us to make sure that we know we can do it safely, it works, it gets out there, and uh, as Dr. Neff noted, it's in the treatment algorithm. It is an option, and, and we're happy to offer it here. How so. often do you perform these kinds of procedures? Do you, do you know, do you performing them every week, every month? Is it just they come in when you're, they're referred to you? I would say at this point it's about uh, maybe five to 10% of my practice. Okay. Um, I do have uh, partners and colleagues who perform it as well. So as a section all together, I would, I would probably say it's about 10% of our practice. Katie point. has a question, this is a great one. Is there long-term data on the success of this procedure? So there is. So the, the since 2010, there's just been a lot of momentum behind this and there's uh, an abundance of literature at this point to support prostatic artery embolization. There is level one data, so there's different levels of data that you can have. Level one is uh, often considered the strongest. Uh, so we're at that point where we can definitely support uh, putting this into the guidelines uh, for a treatment option for BPH. June has a question. Actually, we've got this question a couple different times. Is what, what is it that inspired you to train to do this? How did you discover it, learn about it, and say, I'm gonna master this technique. So a large part of the reason that I came to work at KU is because uh, part of my career goals, kind of what drives me is staying on the cutting edge and advancing the field of medicine. Mm -hmm. And it is an absolute privilege to be at this institution where the entire atmosphere of the medical community is driven uh, to really push things forward, stay on the cutting edge, and and try to help patients as best we can. And so, you know that's why I'm here, um, and that's why I came back. Yeah. When did you know this was wanted? You wanted this to be your specialty. Uh, so I learned about interventional radiology when I was in medical school. Uh, interventional radio, uh, vascular interventional radiology itself is in the broader spectrum a, a younger field in medicine. Uh, but what it lends itself to is innovation and staying on the forefront of procedural medicine. So mm -hmm. I know that I like doing procedures. I know I want to do the latest and the greatest and try to develop things uh, you know, myself and, and see where that's going. And so that's what led me to this field. I want to bring Ken back in and pull up Ken and Dr. Alley together here. Ken, you talked about searching for a doctor to perform this procedure. You were, you know, you were really despairing. What's your advice to people on the power of a second opinion? Well, I would uh, say get as, a, as many opinions as you feel like you need to get so that you feel comfortable that you're making a wise decision of going through whatever procedure you want to go through. So I'm a big fan of getting more opinions. And Dr. Alley, it must feel good to see your patient doing so well. Oh, yeah. I, I, I couldn't be happier. I am uh, absolutely thrilled that we were able to help him out, um, that he's doing better. Um, Quality of life is a, is a huge, huge thing, so um, very pleased. Yeah, you give people their quality of, you give them their lives back. This is someone who was feeling anxiety for if he had to be somewhere more than 10 minutes without a bathroom nearby, and now he's living his life. It's so great to see. We love sharing the incredible work that our doctors do here at the health system, like what we've been talking about with Dr. Alley. We also love giving you a peek at what our doctors are like outside these hospital walls. Now for a secret look into the guardians of healthcare at the University of Kansas Health System, let's go behind the mask. Okay, Dr. Alley, we're going behind the mask and these are the sweetest pictures ever from your wedding and your honeymoon. That is a cool shot. You look like movie stars. Tell us about this. Yeah, that is, uh, that's my wife, Sarah. Mm -hmm. uh, we got married August 19th. Uh, we met about a year ago. We're both pretty active, fit it off pretty quick. Uh, sometimes when you just know, you know. I mm -hmm. uh, play a lot of tennis and volleyball and, and getting out there and we love traveling and you I just could, knew. Couldn't be more excited about the future. Where was the wedding? Tell us about so these So that is the Nelson Atkins Museum in Kansas City. Uh, we got married at the museum. That's so great. How'd you pick that? That's wonderful. Uh, yeah, so we're members of the museum. We uh -huh. uh, like, like art. Uh, it's one of the things that we enjoy. Um, and so that's, it's a great venue. Uh, they, were, it, they were super great. The, everything worked out wonderful. Pictures um, are so cool. Thank you. She's no. gorgeous. Sarah is gorgeous. Uh, yeah, I think so. <laughs> have, you, have you always liked to scuba dive? Because you did some on your honeymoon. Uh, so, Where did you honeymoon? So we, we went, our honeymoon was in Bora Bora. 
I actually finished my certification in Bora Bora. We went on five dives. Um, I pretty much fell in love with scuba diving right away. Was she uh, certified already? Oh yeah, she's been on on several several dives before. So she's an so. adventurer. Yeah. Now, when you're kissing under the water, who's taking the picture? Uh, the dive master. So you have a dive guide, mm -hmm. and so they're there with you the whole time. Did you say ahead of time, hold hold onto this camera? We're going to do something romantic down there, or how do you do pantomime? We're going to kiss. Yeah, they've they've got <laughs> hand, they've got hand signals that they're. <laughs> that they're signaling with so you, so you can breathe with the regulator in your mouth. You That's know. so great. Well, congratulations, and thank you for sharing those pictures with us. And we do have one more thing to share with our viewers. We have a huge announcement, because in addition to the Kansas City Chiefs taking the field tonight for Thursday Night Football, tonight is also the Crucial Catch game and the mission of Crucial Catch to raise awareness for cancer screenings and early detection. And earlier this week, the Chiefs cheerleaders, we love our cheerleaders, and Casey Wolf brought one of the Chiefs' three Lombardi trophies to Hope Lodge. Hope Lodge is magnificent. It's a home away from home for patients and families who are traveling here for cancer treatment. They can stay for weeks at a time completely free of charge. They have dinner with their friends, their neighbors. It's not across the street, it's across the hall. But it really provides, um, you know, kind of a, a center of a community in that conversation, really just a kind of friends supporting friends during a really hard time in their life. If you take a look at your screen right now, there is a QR code we're going to put up there. When you scan that QR code in the bottom right of your screen, it will take you to a place where you can learn how to manage your cancer risk. Since 2009, Crucial Catch has raised more than $27 million to help families who are affected by cancer. I want to thank our viewers for joining the conversation this morning and a big thank you to Dr. Allie and Dr. Neff and to Ken Welk for sharing your journey with us. Ken, thank you. It's going to help a lot of men. Coming up next week on All Things Heart. When a rare blood disorder caused his heart to fail, he needed help that only a few places across the nation offered. How this beloved husband, father, and grandfather credits the medical teams here at the health system with saving his life. That's next Thursday at 8 a.m. Coming up tomorrow on the Morning Medical Update. It's one thing no woman wants to inherit from her mother, breast cancer. I'm Jessica Lovell on the next Morning Medical Update. This woman got checked early because her mom had it and it may have saved her life. We'll share her amazing story Friday at 8.